Welcome to Scary Story Podcast. I have two stories to share with you today. The first story is about an employee who works by the sea. And the second one is about a strange encounter by the fields while working at a bit of an unusual job. I'm Edwin, and here is a scary story. Cotton Candy It was another late night. I was asked to stay here because of the new rules that the administrators asked from all the businesses around here. Food and snack stalls were to remain open until they closed a pier for the night. Merchandise and services were allowed to close at the regular times. The owner was happy about it at first, but we soon realized that few people like to walk around through the fog and the cold of the night around here. I mean, who wants to walk all the way here just to get a burger or a donut? Eh, what am I saying? I know I'd do it. 8pm used to be our closing time, and by then, I would have already wiped down the bench out by the edges of the wooden fencing that looked out into the darkness of the sea. I like to turn off the lights early, that way I could at least see out into the water. A strange thing, right? Light makes us blind to the outside. And I could do it too, because I was the last one there almost every night. I would see those college students make their way here to get a donut, sometimes split one with one another, and just hang out by the fencing, dropping pieces of the sugary bread down into the water, and laughing with each other. They used to lean on the wobbly posts, the same ones that were being used to cut up guts from tiny fish that would later be used as bait by the old guys, who were there a few hours earlier. I wouldn't hose it down until closing time, and I thought about cleaning it before the other customers got there, but I lost track of time and never got around to it. I was waiting for them. I knew they came down on Fridays and sometimes Thursdays. They had gotten to know me as Ryan, and I don't know where they got that name, but it stuck and I just never corrected them. I should have been in school too. I was about their age. I think that's where the unknown grudge I felt toward them stemmed from. But there was lots of things to think about out there. Being alone under a buzzing lamp, my only job seeming to be waving the flies away from the counter and turning on the generators when the power went out. Though even that was hard for me to do. I'd get caught up staring out into the dark water and thinking about lots of things. Everything except burgers and donuts. But there I was, standing, as if ghost customers were lining up to order the owner's latest fancy donut, the sprinkler, when I heard footsteps approaching. I had gotten good at this, and from the sound of it, it was a woman, a younger girl, I don't know, someone light. But there was that other squeaky sound, and where was that coming from? It bumped every few seconds, then more squeaking, and then it stopped then kept approaching. I leaned over the counter to look over to the right, where the sound was coming from. But it got me again. I heard the voice of Gus, the custodian of the place, from the left. That darn echo always made me look the other way. Cotton candy, please, he said, laughing to himself as he always did, lighting a cigarette and leaning against his cart. It was early this time, or was it really closing time? I looked at the clock. The spring forward or fall back, the whole time change arrangement thing we have to do once or twice a year really confused me. It was closing time. I said hi to Gus, completely ignoring the time since I had nothing better to do anyway. Plus, Gus always had news about something he read or something he made up. It was nice to talk to other people in such a lonely place. I could tell he really liked to waste his time at the snack bar, too. He sometimes greeted me with that cotton candy line. Cotton candy, please. I just laughed at it, not really getting the joke. He didn't care. He would crawl under the counter until I could barely see his eyes right above it. And then he'd slap a penny or a button or whatever he had in his pockets against the counter. Cotton candy, please. And then he'd start laughing until he coughed. I tried to follow along with this joke once. I think I said, We don't sell cotton candy here, sir. But he just stood up saying, 
no, I know, and kept laughing. I don't think he got that I had no idea what he was talking about. We talked about the new schedule until I asked him if he wanted a burger. Without waiting for his answer, I threw two of them in the microwave and started it up. Then I went under the counter to turn on the hose to clean the benches and our section of the fence. Gus reached to the microwave and leaned over to get pickles and onions, his usual. He complained a little about the rules, his voice muffled by both the burger in his mouth and the sound of the hose. He was now supposed to stay out there longer than usual, cleaning up after everybody. His main complaint was with the ice cream shop on the other side of the block of stores. People dropped cones and ice cream between the cracks of the wooden planks all the time. The new employee didn't clean them up right away, so they would stick. And that task fell onto Gus. I didn't know many people who worked there. Most were super friendly though, at least during the day. But once the customers were gone, I think we all suffered from the same post-customer depression symptoms. Or maybe it was the fog and temperature of the evening. Watching the sunset by yourself always served as a reminder that you wasted another day. Well, for me it did. Gus kept talking this whole time, but I only heard the last part. She's real pretty, though. You should talk to her, man. I looked up at Gus with excitement, trying to hide it, of course. Lock up, or just leave it like that. She's right there still. I'll introduce you. I hesitated, but I was also numbed by the day, so I just closed the faucet and wiped my hands down on the towel over my shoulders. What's our game plan, he asked. Game plan? No, Gus, I'm just there to say hi. Ask for cotton candy. Do it. There we were, two adults getting all giddy over some girl I'd never met. It was fun, I'll admit. I'd rarely get those hints of excitement, but it was always thanks to people like Gus who pushed me into situations like that. I could see the light of the ice cream shop up ahead, and it was a surprisingly dark part of the pier. I used to walk to the bus stop through my own side and almost never saw this area except during the day, where my friend used to work by the welcome booth. Are you going to do it? Gus asked. Fine, I said to Gus. He was talking about the cotton candy thing. We were trying to be as quiet as possible when we stepped up by the shop when Gus suddenly cleared his throat, interrupted by a scream coming from the ice cream shop. We both stood up as she skipped around, letting another scream and covering part of her face. Tears had built up on her eyes, but not released yet. She had that ridiculous pink and white maid dress the maid employees wear, but the white cap over her dark black hair made up for it. She turned around to grab a paper towel and apologized, saying sorry through her tears and runny nose. Sir, how are you? she said, stuttering. She directed her attention toward Gus and then looked at me. Clearing her throat, she said hi. All three of us stood there until Gus asked what happened if she was okay. It's dumb, she replied. Sorry. But, sir, can you help me with the lock? She asked Gus, holding a key and the enormous lock for the front window. I had to use the same one. Hey, uh, you work here too, right? She said, looking at me. I stood there awkwardly until Gus nudged my arm. Yes, he works here at the snack shop around the corner. What happened? He asked again. I'm so sorry, she said. It's really dumb. Then her eyes filled with water again. Then she said, I saw her. For the first time, I saw the expression on Gus's face change like he wasn't smiling for an instant. Where? Here? he asked. She came up to the window, like everyone said she would. Gus looked at me. I had no idea what he was talking about, but he looked at me as if I did, reaching out to tap my arm. The everything, the girl continued. The wet hair, the dirty dress, the tapping of the shoes. I was cleaning up the inside like the manual says. I kept the cash register open until last, like it says right here, 
in case the customers get here late. But there was nobody. Nobody came. I sat here listening to the water hitting the posts underneath me when I heard someone coming. That was us, Gus interrupted. No, before you guys. She tapped her shoes and dragged her feet and tapped her shoes again. She was singing something or whistling, I don't know. I saw her. I stood up and waited for someone to come up to the counter. I knew my lines. Welcome to the ice cream wave, what can I get for you, right? But all I saw was a tiny hand reach out and splash water right into the counter. I heard a coin against it, but there was nothing when her hand left it. I looked at her. Her eyes were so dark, missing. I think they were missing. She had two ponytails, wet, and they were sticking to her neck. Part of her face was hidden, but I saw the gashes, everything. I'll lock up right now, please. Can you just stay? I'll keep an eye out, Gus said to me, and walked away toward my snack bar. Help her out, I'll wait for you back there. Gus shook his head and his arms as if trying to shake off a spider, talking to himself, saying things like, oh my goodness, and creepy, and other words like that as he walked away. I grabbed the lock and asked her to make sure that the displays were off, that the floor was clean, and that the cash form was signed. You know, since she was new. She looked at me and nodded. Her tears were gone, but her nose was pink now. I asked her to make sure she had signed out and taken the keys with her. She showed them to me and squeezed out of the counter without lifting up the door. She'd figure it out eventually, I thought to myself, feeling a little sorry for her. I squeezed the lock and turned the key and it popped open. That's what she was having trouble with and chuckled, asking if she could try it and then she got it to work. She closed the wooden door over the window and locked it up, asking which way to the snack bar. We started walking along in silence, but just before we turned the corner, she grabbed my arm and leaned closer. We both heard it. The shoes tapping, the dragging against the wooden planks, coming closer behind us. I turned around. There was no one there. Startled, I put my hand behind her back and pushed her alongside me toward the lamppost that was waiting for us around the corner. From behind us, we both heard her voice. I felt her shaking as we got closer to the lit area suddenly erasing everything past those wooden posts of the pier. Gus had referenced her. Everyone knew the story. Everyone except for me. Few claimed to have seen her, Gus being one of them. After being there for so many years, he had heard about her and had even gotten interviewed about it. He had the newspaper clippings on his storage locker, I heard. A girl from the pier, given a quarter by her parents to buy just one thing. In her excitement, she ran through the crowds away from her parents to find her favorite thing in the world. She zigzagged past the popcorn cards in the fishermen's buckets. She squeezed past the posts of the pier that she didn't know led straight into the water. She gripped her quarter as she splashed into the waves. She did not survive. But they say she still walks around here. Cotton candy, please. Goodbye. The next story will continue right after this. From the pier by the sea, we'll move to a house that sits on empty fields. Well, at least we were told it would be empty. Here is 14 hours. When I picked up a job taking care of a house, I didn't know it was a thing. People with lots of money, 
well, I'm assuming so because of their huge homes, give you money to stay at their houses while they go on vacation. Sometimes you feed their cats and dogs and you get access to the entire place and the refrigerator. The first time, the owner met me outside of a grocery store and asked if I wanted to shop around because the house was running low on stuff. She asked me to purchase enough for a week, but if it was more, that it wouldn't be a problem because the food doesn't go to waste in their home. Honestly, I got a little worried because I was really low on cash. She quickly cleared up that it was her that was paying for everything, obviously. Right, obviously. But I didn't know. I thought it was really nice of her and just got what I needed. She dropped me off at the house and parked her car, then gave me the keys and then a taxi came to pick her up. Everything was fine, getting a check for just living. I did that for a few houses based on recommendations, but for a while I thought I might make this my main work. Until something made me change my mind. That and a few other gigs were amazing and simple, but then I started taking jobs into more remote areas. Houses in the desert, mainly. Though there was a nice cabin in the mountains at one point. See, I arrived at another place and was told that there was plenty of food, internet, and everything. That I wouldn't have to worry about anything at all. It was around December, and it would be the longest stay I had done up to that point. About 45 days in a medium-sized home in an enormous field with apple and avocado trees. But I couldn't tell them apart and the entire thing looked bare. Like certain sections of it had burned down. There was one task apart from feeding Boss, the dog, that made me feel a little uncomfortable. It was simple, really. I had to go out into the fields and get to four different checkpoints. The owner, or whoever took care of the place, had set trail cameras to look out into the fields and they had given me a timer that I'd take with me and hang by the front door. When the timer went off, I needed to walk out there and switch the batteries, the memory cards, and reposition them exactly as they were before. It was all written out formally on a laminated piece of paper, as if other people had been tasked with the same thing before. The kitchen was lined up with paper cups and plates, canned food, and it felt like a break room, along with the stinky microwave and mop that looked like the ones that they have at restaurants, with the yellow bucket with wheels. That's what made me wonder if the house was a place for living, or just for workers who took care of the place. I'm not sure if you've been to a house with no decorations, or where they tried to decorate it but they didn't do a good job of it so it just looked empty. That's what this place looked like. There were two bedrooms, each with two beds. Neatly done, hotel style. A big television room with board games and magazines, a huge stack of books, some even on the carpet, and the huge bed for Boss, a St. Bernard who just plopped himself on there and got up only to walk me to the door and to go to his food and water bowls. There was an interesting thing about the timer. It went off every 14 hours, which started off fine, one in the morning and one in the evening. But soon the thing started pinging in the middle of the night. The dog would get up and wait for me by the door where I kept my jacket, and also the rain boots and a big flashlight, along with literally a bowl of memory cards and a box of batteries. Boss would wait by the door until I opened it, and then he stepped out into the porch and then plop himself down by the steps. He would look at me until I stepped out into the dark fields on my own. The first time I left, right at midnight, I was fine. I could hear the wind through the branches of the trees through the music playing on my earphones. But it was later in the night when my mind started playing tricks on me. I started wondering what the purpose of the trail cams were. Those vague instructions simply said to put the memory cards on a transfer device, turn on the computer, and click a few buttons. The cards would then back themselves up to the computer, and that was that. I figured opening up videos of empty fields would be just as boring as it was for me to see them live, so I simply finished up as soon as possible and either went back to Netflix or straight to bed. 
It was four in the morning when Boss scratched at my door. The timer had gone off, but sure enough, I missed it, and the dog knew it. So I put on my boots by the door, got my stuff, and stepped out into the fields again. It was unusually warm at that time. I figured it was just because it was closer to morning time, but later reassessed that. Wasn't it supposed to be colder before dawn? I walked down the main pathway, directly in front of the house and into the trees. The first camera was about five minutes into the field, tied to a tree and pointing away from the house. As I stepped between the trees, I could feel something was off. It was too quiet. I was almost by the first camera when I heard a branch snap above me, and I immediately heard Boss barking non-stop from the front porch. I looked up and could tell apart a small shadow, an animal of some sort, but when I aimed a flashlight at it, it was gone. I looked back down at the camera and switched the battery and memory card, then moved on to the next one, which was on the east side of the house, aimed away from it. The third camera was the same way, but the fourth camera was directly behind the house, aimed at the back door. I could hear only my breathing and footsteps as I went for the camera from the back part of the house, when I heard it again, something in the branches. And like clockwork, Boss started barking again, growling nonstop. I looked up and caught a glimpse of the shadow moving away from me. I heard another branch break. I quickly got to the camera and replaced the card and batteries. I heard it once more. That's when I took off running toward the barking. Boss came running after me. And I called his name, hoping that he wouldn't confuse me with an intruder and bite me. But he ran past me, barking out into the field and then turning toward me before running back up next to me as I went around the house and toward the porch. I was shaking as I set the timer again for 14 hours and placed the memory cards into the device. Boss was still next to me when I opened up the program on the computer and the file started loading. That's when I got the dumb idea to click on one of them. See, those cameras only record when there's movement in front of them with night vision. Surely it would have caught what I had encountered. So I clicked on the footage for the camera, camera number four, and it started playing. And there it was. A squirrel. Right in front of the camera. I felt relief immediately when I saw it eating something from the ground, holding onto it with both of its paws. But then it perked its ears and froze in place. That's when the long fingers of a hand appeared from above the frame and slammed the squirrel into the dirt. Then a long, thin arm reached and scooped up the limp squirrel. The shadow of the long creature zoomed past the camera as dust flew around in front of it. From the center of the frame now, I could see a soft light in the distance. I watched completely frozen as I saw myself walk up to the camera. A long, tall shadow directly behind me, hiding between the trees. It jumped up and snapped the tree branch. It was surreal to see what was hiding in the dark through that camera. Suddenly, the phone on the desk rang. I hadn't heard it ring this whole time. Hey, we had an issue with the transfer of camera number four. Can you try again? I agreed and hung up. I stopped watching the file, and I just clicked the transfer button. I asked for a replacement for my stay, blaming it on a personal reason that I had to leave. They had no problem with that. I got my stuff together and said goodbye to boss the next day. Something he was probably used to.